Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fifth Science Policy Forum for Biodiversity and eighth International Conference on Sustainability Science. And this session is led by UNEP IMP and the Chinese Society for Environmental Sciences and co-led by CBD Secretariat, UNEP Science Division and Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. And my name is Ling Xiu Zhang, I'm chairing this uh, um, plenary session and I'm the director of UNEP IMP, which is a partnership center between UNEP and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Yeah. And before we go to the keynote presentations, I wanted to uh, say this is, today's session is the third session and continued from the other two. And the topic is on harnessing science technology and innovations to support the implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And we have a variety of speakers today to talk about this topic, and they are to be introduced session by session over the next two hours. And now I wanted to uh, do a few housekeeping and kind of uh, announcement because we have a lot of people Join in the session. At the moment, we have more than 100, I think more than 120 now, 10. And uh, the number I'm sure is going up over the time. And we would like to ask you please to use the Q&A tab to submit questions to our speakers and the panelists. The answered questions would be visible to everybody, hopefully. And in case our panelists would also like to ask questions to your fellow panelists, and please use the chat option with the drop down of panelists enabled to send them only to the panelists. And this is to be help in order to help panelists and dark the system limitation for the panelists not to being able to send the question to the QA tab. The chat tab will be used for informal communications only and for example, posting housekeeping announcement there. As a panel, we'll answer only a limited number of questions in the given time during the live session. For all the unanswered questions during the live session, they will be posted on the forum's website. And the such virtual space will remain open for three working days after the end of this session and to give the opportunity for the panelists to answer the remaining questions in writing and for the online discussions to continue. And the session, of course, is also being recorded and be live streamed on YouTube. I know Claudia wants to add a couple more housekeeping points. Claudia. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, just very briefly regarding the online um, discussion uh, on the forum website. Um, as you have uh, rightfully pointed out, the questions that because of time will not be answered in full during the live session, they will be reposted on such online forum. Uh, and the discussion will continue for three days uh, following the end of this session. Um, all attendees will be receiving uh, a link uh, with a password that will enable them to log in and continue this discussion online during the next three days. Um, and importantly, um, this invitation and the related password um, is being sent just once uh, for all the sessions. So if you have already participated to the first session or to the second session, you should have already received uh, such automatic email um, that will uh, allow you to log in. If that is not the case, uh, an email address for troubleshooting is being posted on the chat and please contact uh, technical assistance so that they will be uh, resending you that email invitation with the password. If you are joining the forum for the first time today, then please, uh, we beg your indulgence to be patient for um, until um, tomorrow, uh, as the system might take some time to process the additional email, but you should be receiving that email invitation uh, very shortly. If by tomorrow you have not received it, once again, and if you want to log in to continue the discussion, please 
uh, take note of the uh, troubleshooting email and uh, alert us, then we will try to um, uh, resend the invitation accordingly. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Over. Thank you, Claudio. And now we will uh, be going into the first part of the session. And in this session, we will have three keynote presentations and tackling issues such as the role of scientific and technology innovations and strategies to promote innovative solutions and the importance of transparency and early community engagement for trust in science in support of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Then the session will be divided into two breakout groups and uh, Claudia and the, the tech group were let you know how to get into different groups. And uh, the, the one, the breakout groups, I, I better, maybe it's better I introduce here. The one breakout the group is led by UNEP IMP, which is to discuss about nexus of biodiversity conservation or ecosystem restoration, climate change and livelihood improvement. The chair of the uh, uh, breakout the group one is Dr. Art Hansen who is a distinguished fellow and a former president with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And he has very much rich experiences in all the things that we're talking about today, but due to time limitation, I'm not gonna read out his bio. It's all posted in to, in the web, on the website. The other breakout session is led by IGES, i.e. the Institute for Global Environment Strategies to talk about the current landscape of renewable energy technologies and applications and its implication on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The chair of the breakout group two is Dr. Osamu Saito, who is a principal policy researcher at IGES. And also he has a rich experience in the, in the work that relates to what we're talking about. But again, due to the time limitation, I wish that you could go to the website and read their bios in more detail. As we do have a tight time schedule today, we may not be able to have a QA round after the first plenary part, but I hope we will make available some time for Q&A in the breakout group discussions later on. At the end of the session, we will return back to the plenary and we'll have opportunities to hear from the two chairs from each of the breakout groups on the key messages and then a wrap up for the full session. Now, I'm delighted to invite Dr. Yan Liu, the director from the Research Center of Biodiversity Conservation and Biodiversity, and Nanjing Institute of Environmental Sciences and Minister of Ecology and Environment of People's Republic of China to give the first keynote presentation on the role of scientific and technological innovation in promoting biodiversity conservation. As you know that most of our work has being focused on biological conservation, including biodiversity investigation and observation, restoration in ecological damage areas and risk assessment of genetically modified organisms. Dr. Liu was involved in compiling the national report of implementation of CBD and the CPB of China. Dr. Liu, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair Zhang. Um, and it's my pleasure to share some of my views of the scientific and technology innovation in promoting biodiversity conservation. The three, uh, I think uh, there are some progress, uh, not only on the national scale, but also on the global scale, that the scientific and technology cooperation in the edge target and for the post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. And uh, the last part of my presentation is about the some uh, points and to how to uh, move on the scientific and technology uh, uh, conservation or uh, uh, cooperation and co uh, yes and innovation. Well, according to uh, China's national uh, investment uh, in research and development, um, especially in scientific uh, and technological. Uh, I think the investment has increasingly uh, uh, continuously with the country's research uh, in, in investment accounting for more than 2% of GDP for the first time since 2014. And by 
2020, China's total investment in research and uh, development will reach uh, more than 2,000 billion yuan, accounting for 2.4% uh, of the GDP. Uh, here, I just uh, give some uh, examples. We have used uh, uh, new technologies in our uh, national program on how to uh, help people, uh, our uh, uh, working teams to conduct uh, the biological diversity uh, surveys and uh, observation and investigations. And also in the uh, national, next, next slide, please. Uh, yes, here's some, um, also we use the harmonic curator to a new method for investigation on social pollination insects. Uh, how the, uh, uh, the, the insects play in the pollination uh, pro uh, program, pro uh, processing. And also the satellite tracking technology in, in the birds, uh, the uh, movement and also the uh, like thermal imager carried by uh, UAV that uh, can uh, study on the uh, mammals. What next, please? And also, we uh, did a lot in the uh, um, international scientific and uh, uh, technology uh, cooperation, not only in the uh, regional level, but also in the sub regional level, such as we have. Uh, like build up a, a Southeast Asia science and education centers. We have what we have done is right, right, uh, is to uh, cooperation with cooperate with the countries there and the peoples of uh, science research there uh, to conduct uh, uh, like biodiversity survey jointly and also uh, to strengthen the cooperative research with Southeast Asian countries. Uh, such as Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And also there's some uh, tra tra training and conferences uh, conducted in these areas like uh, training forestry personnel, um, seminars, and also uh, for African wildlife uh, conservation and also the biodiversity conservation and management seminars. Next one, please. Yeah, next. Yeah. Could so you in the, wrap up in a minute or two? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, for the looking to the future, China will increase its investment in research and development in the field of biodiversity, uh, promoting research and achievement in the field, and also continue to strengthen the transfer and transformation of basic research. And also we carried out risk assessment of uh, invasive alien species and uh, GMOs, and also uh, formulate rules and regulations of uh, ABS, of the genetic resources. Also, we uh, continue to increase investment in personnel uh, training, promoting implementation under the CBD and, the internet and other international cooperation. Next one, please. Well, according to the reports uh, last year, uh, like GBO5, and uh, the IPBES assessment report in 2019, there's uh, many, uh, well, there's many uh, uh, new progress under the uh, uh, target 19 of edge targets. Uh, but also we still have many challenges uh, that on, even we have, we already on the uh, successful track towards the, uh, this target. And also, I think many of our presenters will give some of the uh, points on how the uh, science and knowledge sharing and transfers of this in, in the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity uh, framework. So next one, please. Yeah. Could you wrap up? We are running, running okay. out of time. Okay, I will, I will, yeah, I will finish in, in one or two minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, the, here's uh, the uh, negotiation progress under the GBF, post 20th century uh, GBF. So I will uh, skip it to the last part of my presentation. No, next one, yes. Uh, here's my uh, personal uh, points how to do in, in the, on the next steps. 
there are three uh, points. Uh, first one is to um, to uh, establish overall overall uh, coordination between science, technology, and the post twenty twenty GBF to promote a more scientific and feasible post twenty twenty uh, global biodiversity framework. Now, also, secondly, uh, the build a clear indicators at both global and national levels to promote countries activity uh, contributing to the achievement of global targets. And last but the not uh, yeah. Uh, establish an innovative resource mobilization mechanism to enhance implementation capacity development of the developing countries. And, and yes, and that's my presentation today. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And this uh, was a rich of information on how China does in this in the biodiversity conservation with science and technology. Uh, without further ado, uh, now we'd like to move to our next speaker um, of the, uh, the keynote speaker, and Dr. Jamison Irvin, who is a manager of Nature for Development Program at UNDP. And she will talk about strategies to promote innovative solutions in support of a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And Dr. Irvin, has worked at the intersection of nature and the development since 1990 and have worked at UNEP, uh, UNDP focuses on enabling countries to develop a map of hope for nature dependent goals that puts nature at the heart of sustainable development. She also focuses on supporting local action on nature based solutions, including leading UNDP's Equator initiative on supporting governments in identifying nature-based solutions for climate and on supporting action and ambition on protected areas. And Dr. Evan, you have the floor now. Hi, I'm Jameson Irvin, and I'll be talking today about strategies for innovative solutions to support the post-2020 biodiversity global framework. We know that nature underpins development, whether that's food security, alleviating poverty, mitigating climate, and providing sustainable jobs and livelihoods or water security, nature is foundational to our well-being. We also know that we're facing a four-part planetary emergency that includes a climate emergency, a nature emergency, an inequality emergency, and of course, a global health emergency. And these emergencies are interlinked. We know that our global economic model is broken. A World Economic Forum report showed that more than half of global GDP, $44 trillion, is at risk from biodiversity loss. And a single headline in the Financial Times two years ago simply said, capitalism, it's time for a reset, because we are recognizing that our global economic model is broken. We also know the global development model is broken. A recent report by the United Nations Development Program for the Human Development Report 2020 found that no country has achieved a high level of development without first having had a significant negative impact on the environment. We can't continue in this trajectory. The Convention on Biological Diversity's Conference of Party Parties 15, COP15, is our last best chance to reposition nature at the heart of sustainable development, to galvanize political will, to set the right ambition, set the right goals, the right targets and the indicators, to change our trajectory. To make the outcomes of COP15 stick, however, we must transform how we use data. We do not have a deficit of data. We have more data in the last two years than we have in all of human history combined. But we must identify the data, the data systems, the indicators, the metrics, the platforms that will galvanize change. We need innovative data solutions. I'd like to propose seven strategies for how we do this. First, we need to make the data relevant to our planetary crises. We need to link data to nature-dependent ecosystem services, such as climate, or water security, livelihoods, or disaster risk reduction. We also need to move away from single dimensional indicators, 
such as forest cover, forest loss, protected areas, and combine these in new ways toward integrative indices and metrics that provide insight, such as an index on water security or water security loss for the water insecure city of Dar es Salaam. We also know that creating data in such a way leads to actionable results. We need to create data that results in actions that governments and communities can take. We need to know where to, where to restore forests, where do we need to protect and manage intact forests, where do we need to improve the management of protected areas in order, for example, to achieve water security. The second strategy is we need to make the data easily accessible. Right now, we have so many different sources of data that don't speak to each other. I'm excited to be part of the UN Biodiversity Lab partnership with the United Nations Environment Program, with the Convention on Biological Diversity and others, that we can create a portal where anyone can drop and drag their own data and begin to see how these data combine to create new insight. Third, we must make national reporting easy, dynamic, automated. Right now we have a system where we report every two or even four years on changes using data that might be 10 or 15 or even 20 years out of date. We need dynamic data. We need di dynamic decision support systems that help countries see where they are from month to month. Fourth, we need to make data on headline indicators readily available. That means we must be able to aggregate local and national data into global data reporting on headline indicators to have snap snapshots in time. Fifth, we need to make data inclusive. Data can be controversial and contested, so data platforms need to enable multiple types and sources of data, and reaching societal agreement about data can transform decision making. We also need to include indigenous peoples and local communities and civil society. If we are to reach ambitious goals of protecting 30% of terrestrial marine area by 2030, we must engage indigenous peoples and local communities. We must respect their lands and territories. This is an example from a community in Peru who uses satellite imagery and platforms to achieve zero deforestation. And that data is invaluable at a community level, at a national level, and at a global level. We need to make data models and tools customizable so we can dial up decarbonization and urban cooling in Costa Rica. We can dial up water security in Colombia, green recovery in Peru, and food security in Kazakhstan. Seventh, we need to make the data matter to policymakers. And that means not just focusing on how to maintain biodiversity. So many, so much of our effort on data, on indicators, on targets, focuses just on biodiversity. We need to pivot to focusing on the value of nature in achieving national goals related to carbon sequestration, water security, disaster risk reduction, food security, and jobs and livelihoods. This is a map of Costa Rica's map of hope, where they've combined these data into a single map where they hope they can protect, manage, and restore nature to achieve their nature-dependent sustainable development goals. And Andrea Meza Murillo from the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica says, these maps of hope can guide us to take action on nature for climate, on nature for life. We need to have policymakers champion the results because they speak to national development goals. Scientists tell us we have 10 years to get this right. We have one decade of action that will affect the rest of our century. Let's make sure that the decade of action is informed by data that drives better decision and helps transform and bend the curve on nature loss toward a decade of hope and transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Irvin. Uh, uh, before I go for, to introduce next uh, keynote speaker, I just want to remind you that please, if uh, there's a, any questions that you want to address, please do use the Q&A function rather than the chat. We now have more than 200 participants uh, on, on, on in this uh, plenary. So now let me invite our last but never the least a, a keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Kevin Esvel. 
and who is a leader of Sculpture Evolution Group and professor at MIT, who is going to talk about the importance of transparency and early community engagement for trust in science. Dr. Özbert was the first to discover that, I don't know how to pronounce it, CRISPR based gene drive systems that could edit wide populations. And usually he and his colleagues choose to publicly describe the technology and highlight the need for safeguards before testing it and demonstrating reversibility in the laboratory. Dr. Osvin, please, you have the floor now. I'm Kevin Esfeld from MIT, and I'm interested in eco-technologies. I wish I could be speaking with you in person today, but of course, many of us and our loved ones are still waiting on vaccines. Now, what's interesting about vaccines is that they were not developed transparently, but that's okay. Each of us can individually decide whether or not we want to take a vaccine. We can give our free, prior, and informed consent. But that's not true of eco-technologies, technologies intended to change the shared environment. If my laboratory develops an eco-technology, say, we want to alter the mice so that they can't infect ticks with Lyme disease, if we develop that application without asking communities how they want us to do it, then we're denying them a free, prior, and informed voice on early stage research decisions that will ultimately shape this technology. And because it will change the shared environment, if it's used, it's going to impact everyone and everything living in that particular ecosystem. I believe all eco-technologies should be developed transparently with community guidance from the beginning. And I've spent the last several years trying to find out how this can be done. And what it looks like is missing is a single point of coordination that I believe the UN could provide by hosting a registry for all eco-technology applications. But before I go on and talk about that, I should disclose that I do have a conflict of interest here. I was the one who first disclosed how to use CRISPR genome editing to alter a wild population or even an entire wild species using CRISPR-based gene drive. And because I had the opportunity to tell the world how to do it, what safeguards should be used, and how I thought we should go about it ethically, that means I must hold myself morally responsible for any and all consequences, no matter who does the development and the release. So my laboratory has been spending the last several years trying to figure out how should we be going about this? Which approaches work? We've gone to the islands off the coast of Massachusetts, near where I work at MIT, to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And we asked them about the Lyme disease application before we'd done anything. We said, is this something you might be interested in? There's a bunch of different ways we could do it. How would you like us to go about it, assuming you're interested? And how do you want to guide this project? Who do you want to keep an eye on it and make sure that what we're doing is in line with your preferences? The idea is we want open community-guided science. Discussion should happen before experiments and safeguards should all be agreed upon early, which is essential when you're talking about a technology that could spread. In this case, we're not using gene drive, but even so, those early stage research decisions will impact the eventual application. And what we've learned from the communities has actually shaped the direction of our research, the ways that we're developing these mice. And many people have said, you know, I'm not sure I like the idea of editing the mice, but this is exactly how the research should be done. Now that's just one community, or rather two. We're interested in talking to communities with very different ideas, very different values. And on another project, we seek to replace 
rodenticide poisons, which are horrifically inhumane, killing at least a billion rodents every year in excruciating agony. But they also have horrific environmental side effects, typically poisoning a wide variety of predators that eat rodents. We believe biotech can do better by reducing rodent fecundity. And so we reached out to the city of Cambridge to see if they might be interested in guiding our research. But we also recognized that rodents are the number one cause of extinction on islands. And New Zealand has a predator-free 2050 campaign that has pledged to get rid of all invasive rats from Aotearoa. So we were aware that whatever we developed might eventually be used there. So we reached out to the Maori, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, to ask them what they thought and which values of theirs might end up shaping our technology development. Even though we're not developing it for Aotearoa, the fact that it might be used there means that we felt obligated to reach out and hear what they thought. So we've been returning every few years, except for this past year, to renew our relationship and hear what different iwis and hapus from all over Aotearoa believe should be done. And what we've learned from Moru, from Mana, from Kaitiaki Tenga, and especially from Fukupapa, the way they view the relatedness of species, that we should be developing this application in particular ways, using particular source genes, in, and in ways that require Maori involvement, should they ever be used. And we've pledged that if there is not widespread Maori support for their use in Aotearoa, then we will also publicly oppose their use there. So this is in part why I think the UN should host a registry, because this approach works. It can help determine whether communities are actually interested early enough to shape the direction of the technology or cause the researchers to walk away. The challenge is scientists are incentivized to keep our work a secret, because if we disclose our fabulous new idea, we risk someone else publishing it first. And that makes it hard to reach out to communities and say, here is what we can do. What do you want? To change that, we need to change scientific incentives. And the registry could do that by creating a focal point that could be endorsed by scientific journals and funders of research and development for these kinds of projects, for eco-technologies. What should the registry say? Well, at a minimum, it should include the basic information on what the project seeks to accomplish. It needs to specify which communities have been approached and invited to guide the research and which ones have accepted agreeing to sponsor the project through continued conversations. It needs to specify which technical options were presented to communities. This shouldn't be just a yes, no thing. This should be a, how do you want us to go about it? Which kinds of genes do you want us to use from which organisms, which kinds of tweaks? How do you want it to change the environment, if at all? It needs to discuss safeguards. Which are the safeguards that will be used? That's absolutely essential for something like a gene drive, which can spread on its own once released. Yet almost no regula regulations anywhere in the world have been updated to deal with gene drive. A registry, again, could help change that by requiring researchers to specify which safeguards they're using. And of course, we should have to disclose technical details on what we're proposing, because the only way to reliably determine if it's safe is to invite anyone and everyone to scrutinize it and find out whether there are potential flaws. What might go wrong? By hosting a registry, the UN could ensure that we have freely given prior and informed community guidance of eco-technology development, because we all rely on the shared environment and we all have an obligation to other living things to use our power as wisely as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osvet. 
With that, we concluded the plenary of the session.